Andrew Ketstever, the interim vice president at OSU Cascades, Oregon State University's growing campus here in Bend, Oregon. It's my pleasure and honor to open tonight's event, an event with Tamika Mallory, Real Activism, brought to you by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Laboratory at OSU Cascades. More than 600 people from Central Oregon, throughout Oregon, around the country, and indeed from overseas, registered for tonight's event. What's more, students, faculty, and staff are on all of our campuses right now are gathered at watch parties, ready to view this important discussion with Ms. Mallory on screens in Edward J. Ray Hall here at OSU Cascades and in the Memorial Union Ballroom in Corvallis. The popularity of tonight's event is a testament to our esteemed speaker, Tamika Mallory and to her leadership on behalf of Black Lives Matter and so many other social issues. It's also a testament to the hunger in our communities and on our university campuses for knowledge that can help us heal past wrongs and advance social justice in Oregon. Our state has come a long way since its black exclusion laws in the 1800s and early 1900s, but of course, there is still much work to do. I know so many of you join us in wanting to create a society where all are welcome and have equal opportunity to thrive no matter their race, religion, gender identity, education, or financial status. Your voices are welcome and indeed they are needed. There are a few people who have been stronger champions of social justice than your host this evening, Erica McAlpine. Erica is the founder of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Laboratory at OSU Cascades, the newly named Executive Director for Strategic Diversity Initiatives at OSU Cascades as well. Erica is, is a recognized advocate for advancing social equity and inclusion within OSU, and she has woven those themes in her teaching and her work with students. In 2019, she received the OSU Francis Dancy Hook Award for building bridges across cultures and showing courage in promoting diversity. The, she also received the OSU Cascades Diversity Award and was named Source Weekly's Woman of the Year. Since then, Erica has been selected by her peers for increasingly responsible roles within the OSU Faculty Senate and was most recently voted to serve as its president beginning in January. I'm enormously proud to share that she will be the first person from OSU Cascades to be elected to lead the OSU Faculty Senate. Erica is also active within the Central Oregon community. Her service includes positions on the boards of directors of Volunteers in Medicine and on City Club of Central Oregon. She is the co-founder of Love Your Neighbor, a grassroots effort that encourages community members to appreciate and accept fellow residents from diverse backgrounds. Prior to joining OSU Cascades, Erica taught at the University of Alabama, where she was awarded the Morissette Award for Excellence in Teaching Leadership and Ethics and the J. Craig Smith Integrity Award. Erica will be your MC this evening as she introduces Ms. Mallory and hosts an open and wide-ranging conversation with her about activism. Thank you all for joining us. Now please welcome our Executive Director for Strategic Diversity Initiatives, Erica McAlpin. Thank you, Vice President Kat Stever, and welcome everyone again to an evening with Tamika Mallory, Real Activism. On behalf of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Laboratory at Oregon State University Cascades and the OSU President's Commission on the Status of Black Faculty and Staff Affairs, I'm honored that all of you have joined us online and also at watch parties on our campuses in Bend and Corvallis for this timely discussion. In fact, if you, well, let's see, before we get started, um, as with all of our virtual production events, know that we encourage audience participation. 
Throughout tonight's live stream, audience members can use Mentimeter to submit questions. Use your mobile device's camera to capture the QR code on the screen now, or type menti.com into your web browser. Our event code is 36467757. After typing in the code, simply follow the instructions. The event code will remain up for the duration of our live stream. Second, I invite you to join me for our next presentation hosted by the DEI Lab, Reckoning with Race and Racism in America, will be presented by Michael Eric Dyson on November 3rd. Dyson is a distinguished professor of African American Studies, Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt University, and the author or editor of more than 20 books on subjects from Malcolm X to Tupac Shakur. The program is free, and you can find registration information on Eventbrite or at osucascades.edu. We began our discussion this evening on community activism against the backdrop of a tragic event that took place in Bend just a few short weeks ago. In the early hours of Sunday, September 19th, Barry Washington Jr., a 22-year-old 22, a Black man from Northern California, was shot and killed on a downtown sidewalk. An investigation is still underway, but there has been an arrest. Before we move on, I invite you to please join me in silence to remember the life of Mr. Washington. Thank you. I had no way of knowing that such a tragic event would happen in Central Oregon just weeks before I'm, our invited guest was scheduled to speak. However, with the death of Mr. Washington and the impact it had on our community, and by extension on communities throughout our nation, I believe there is no better person to speak with at this moment about activism than Tamika D. Mallory. Tamika Mallory is a nationally recognized civil rights activist and seasoned community organizer. She served as the youngest ever executive director of the National Action Network. Ms. Mallory was also the co-chair of the Women's March on Washington in 2019, the largest single day demonstration in United States history. In 2020, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, she gave what has been called the speech of a generation in a widely shared address titled State of Emergency. Ms. Mallory is an expert in the areas of gun violence prevention, criminal justice reform, and grassroots organizing. It is with great joy and admiration that I welcome Tamika Mallory. Hello. Hi, Ms. Hi. Erica, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so oh. much for having me on. I had some technical stuff going on, but I figured it out. So here we are. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I'm honored to be here with you. Yes, ma'am. So we wanna get started just by diving in and asking some questions. And um, I wanna let you know that I read your book and okay. I am just um, in awe. I highly recommend it to everyone in the audience. Um, and if you, if you can listen to it in the sound of her voice, I believe that it's even more powerful. It is available on Audible. Yeah. So in your book, State of Emergency, How to Win in the Country We Built, you have a foreword from Cardi B. She mentions that she's not an activist, that you're the activist. Please share with the audience tonight what being an activist means to you. Wow. So, you know, I think Cardi is um, a little mistaken when she says that she's not an activist. I think what uh, would be more appropriate is saying that she's not a social, a social justice organizer, which would be someone who is dedicated every day to organizing rallies and campaigns and efforts around particular causes. But I think she is an activist. Um, you know, I think that anyone who is willing to speak out when they see injustice, anyone who is willing to 
add um, or lend their voice, their time, and especially their financial resources to try to help those of us who are organizers is an activist, people who are not hiding in the shadows, but have made it very clear in their places of work, um, you know, especially with the public profile. And of course, um, you know, somebody like Card Cardi in general, who could really just keep quiet on those issues, even having her to, uh, to, to be a part of my book, I'm sure there are people on her team who probably said, maybe this is not the right thing to do. It's too radical. Um, it's not the right time. You know, you're so far in your career. You're trying to do whatever deal here and there. Let's stay away from these things. But, you know, she was very, very willing. Um, she was more concerned about how her voice would be uh, represented in the book because she kept saying, you know, this is not my area. And so I don't, I don't know if what I'm saying is right. But I think that what we eventually asked her to talk about um, and what I was able to get from her in all of the conversations that we had is exactly the type of um, information that so many other people who are activists or want to become activists are trying to figure out, which is I care about these issues. I want to be at the table, but I'm not sure where I fit, especially if my day to day life is not about this work all the time. You know, and so I, I do think that, you know, there are many people people who are activists, who are out there in the world, um, every single us have not been uh, deputized, as, as you will, if you will, by someone who they look at and a leader uh, who has the authority to give them a title. Um, I don't think they need that. I don't think anyone needs that branding from someone like me or any other person who's considered to be a leader. I think we we all should know that if we're there to be in an organized it is a different conversation. Okay, thank you so much. So when you look around the country and see the many forms that activism has taken, what feedback do you have for young people that are doing this work or anybody that wants to do this work? You know, I would say my feedback is jump in. And I think it kind of is sort of like um, a continuation of what I was just saying. Oftentimes we're waiting on someone to tell us that it's okay for us to get involved. We're waiting on someone to tell us that we're worthy, that we're sharpened enough, that we have the right language. I can tell you that I, I experienced that in my younger years. Uh, I was, you know, not always confident that I was, that I had what it takes um, to be an activist, to be a leader, to be an organizer. And so I was constantly waiting for someone to tell me that I'm ready, you know, that it's my time. And I think that some of our older leadership, um, you know, could should do better at making sure that younger people feel like, not like they're the kids in the church, because, you know, there's the kids in the church, but the kids in the church are not necessarily seen as being ordained to minister, to, you know, to provide healing and to provide a, you know, sense of hope to the congregation. When in fact, sometimes younger people we find are prepared. They're ready because the calling is already on them. And so I think we as older people, I'm now in the older uh, people section of the room. I'm 41 years old. And when I see 25, 30 year old leaders, as there are many around me, I try to make sure that they are affirmed that whatever they want to do in this work, that they have the ability, the right, and that there is space for them and that they're actually needed. So I would say young people should know that, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. I would say that young people should know that. They should know that, you know, you don't need the affirmation of some person who is outside of you to allow you to believe that you can make a difference. You know, Dr. King was 39 years old when he died and he didn't, he didn't, you know, do all his work, live and die in a short period of time. There were many years that Dr. King was out there learning, preaching, speaking, moving around. Um, and we get to learn so much about the last few years of his life 
Um, but there was much time that he had been in the work being a, a young boy who already was ordained to preach. Um, and so if that's the case, if we know that about Dr. King, students who are sitting right now in Oregon State, you are ready. Like, you know what I mean? You're, yes. you're, you're actually the young, powerful, fresh voice that we're looking for in this work that we need in order for us to move to the next step. Because there comes points when the movement is stagnant. And it's stagnant because people who, who have been doing it for a while run out of steam and energy. People, uh, you know, as, as I said, they get tired, but then also you have folks who have to pay their bills. You know, they're, they have families, they have other things that they need to do. And Lord knows being a leader in this work, it's not the place where you're gonna make millions of dollars. Contrary to the nonsense that we hear on social media, where there are trolls out there trying to give people the impression that this, this is a big money scheme or that you're gonna make a lot of money. It's actually not true. Um, you know, you, 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 I'm not saying that we can't get a salary and we absolutely should be paid because this is work, it is daily work. And it's not like I can go now and work for a corporation and, you know, find a place where I can just, you know, make millions of dollars within some big corporation. That's not possible that I'm, you know, I'm blackballed from that type of work um, just because of the nature of, of the, the different ideas of those people who would be in positions of power to give me those jobs or that job. Um, so yes, we should be employed in this work, we should receive um, compensation, health care, and all the things that we need. Because if we pay entertainers, then we certainly should be paying those people who are leaders who are out there. But it is right. not a place that you're going to come and find millions and millions of dollars. And if you do, it's questionable. Trust me, mm -hmm. how, how will that's working out? So when people, as they get older, they have families, they have more responsibilities, their ability to stay outside every single day, to be, you know, in, in these fights, to take risks, it changes. So the younger generation brings a sense of freshness to the movement that gives us the opportunity to pass the baton and keep the work going. And I always say it is the spirit of the youth, but it's definitely the wisdom of the elders that when you put those two things together and combine them, you have a powerful movement. Thank you. So as you know, there are many ways to break down systems of oppression. Some of us do it from the inside while others take to the streets. And there are many ways in between. How do you handle critique from those that are of the same race and ethnicity as you? Well, um, I handle it, you know, it's not, it's not easy. Um, I think what, here's what I'll say. It depends on who it's coming from. Cause there are some people that critique me that I couldn't care less, right? Like there's, you couldn't get me to care even this much about what some people have to say because I already know, I understand their motives. I've been doing this for long enough that I know the difference between a person who is traumatized, who is, is critiquing what they see or don't see what they know and don't know, you know, perhaps they don't really understand um, or lashing out because of their own hurt. It's a very, that that's that's something that I do take seriously. But when I find people who spend their day and night talking about Tamika Mallory every day. They wake up in the morning and they got, you know, they, they're making their YouTube pages and their Instagram and all of that off of just calling my name all day. I know that they're using my platform in order to try to gain their own. They're mm -hmm. using something that took me 25 years of public work because I've been in this work all my life. But wow. 25 years of public work that I've been out here uh, really, you know, hitting the pavement and learning and growing and doing the work that I'm doing. Um, these people use that as, as a way to try to shorten the time for their platform to be built. Mm -hmm. That's what people are generally looking for. They're mm -hmm. trying to take your long, your long standing, your long-term work, the pain and sweat 
that you have put in, the sweat equity, as they say, and they want to shorten theirs in a two-year time span by finding a way to use you as a storyline and to make up any kind, anything they want. There was a time in my life where I wasn't just, um, I wasn't just angry about it. I wanted to fight. Like I was like, you know, where could we meet? Like outside in the schoolyard at three o'clock type of thing. Mm -hmm. And as I get, I'm getting older, one, I have different priorities. You know, my son is now 22 years old and now he's become my best friend and the conversations that we're having about starting businesses together and, and, you know, growing together has taken my attention to a place that I'm not even, I don't have time to focus on what they have to say. I also understand that there are people out here who really want me dead. I know this. I, I see the death threats. You know, we've been um, informed by law enforcement when things are happening that are real, like serious threats to our lives. Um, you know, when we're out in these communities, we experience real serious situations. So people who are critiquing online, I have learned that those people are spending my time focused on people, first of all, who most of them are only online. It's not as if they're showing up at the protest and they're critiquing me there. They are literally just, they just have an online profile. So that's helped me mentally. Um, I also understand that the struggles that we're in and the legacy that I want to leave behind for myself is one that is so, um, you know, it, it, I haven't reached it yet. And therefore I don't have time to meddle myself in the, the mess of who said what and who's, you know, making whatever comments about me. Mm -hmm. But there are people in our community, especially when I hear black men saying, well, you know, Tamika Mallory doesn't care about black men. You know, she only cares about black women, things like that. That does bother me um, because my brothers mean a lot to me. Uh, my whole life, my whole career, I've been fighting for Black men uh, and have found that I fought for Black men harder than I fought for myself, for Black women. Um, and so I have, I, I do have um, some issues in that area that I work on all the time because that is a, <coughs> I want to make sure that if I'm doing something that makes Black trans people, Black men, um, you know, and even Black women feel as if they are not of, um, you know, of a central concern and focus for me. I always want to listen to that critique, see whether or not I feel it's real, and then take whatever I can from it and try to apply it to how I move forward. It's okay to listen to some critique and not be defensive. It's okay mm -hmm. to listen, to understand, and then to try to apply some different measures um, to your work and to, you know, your, your activities. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a mixture. It's, it's those that I could care less about, or couldn't care less about. And then there are those that I take seriously, their words, and I use it as a part of my growth process and the development of the work that I do every single day and what it is that I am attempting to create in the world. Right, right. Thank you for that, because that helps me. So thank you so much. And I will say that there is an entire chapter in your book that is dedicated to Black men and your care for Black men. So um, yeah. I can attest to that not being true. So I want to shift gears just a little bit and um, provide some advice to allies. I live in a place that where uh, less than 1% of the population is Black. And there are many allies in the community that want to support this important work. What is your advice to them? You know, the allies um, conversation is really, really important. Um, I, I find myself standing alongside lots of people in this work, um, especially white folks who we appreciate. You know, it takes, I, I mean, I think when I was talking about Dr. King already, when I think back over, the movement in the 60s, it really, and it's particularly this fight around voting rights, it really took white folks to join um, Dr. King and Congressman John Lewis and others to say um, that what was happening in the South, <coughs> that it was wrong, and that they would be a part of those protests where people were beaten bloody, um, that they would put themselves on the front line. 
And we got a lot of a lot more attention to the movement based upon white people getting involved. So we know that the fight, the struggle for freedom is not one that can be fought with one group of people. In fact, those individuals who are um, responsible for our oppression, they have to be at the front and center. They have to be front and center in terms of helping to fight against it and to dismantle systems of oppression. And so, so having allies is important. But when I, when I talk about the state of emergency, and, it, and the reason why this comes to me is because I think about my time at um, Women's March and how there were many people who were allies. They were ready to protest, ready to get in there. But when we started to struggle and go through very difficult attacks that were coming at us from all different directions, their allyship ended. It wasn't as strong. Um, and so uh, one of the terms that my sister Carmen Perez um, who runs, she's the executive director of Harry Belafonte's organization, The Gathering for Justice. She often talks about not needing allies, but needing accomplices. And accomplices are people who we down together. So whatever you're willing to sacrifice, I'm willing to sacrifice the same thing. And we're going at this together. I won't leave you, you won't leave me. So when it gets tough, because we are accomplices, if they give you 20 years, then I'm getting 20 years. I won't leave you just because things got difficult. And what we find with allies oftentimes is that they can go home, turn it off, you know, take off the armor that they've been out fighting with all day, um, go back to their families, even go back around people who are racist, um, people who are sexist. They can go, uh, you know, they can go back and tolerate xenophobia. Um, and what we're saying is, we need people who are willing to get uninvited from the Thanksgiving dinner. Thanksgiving is coming up. You know that you're in a family and your family members make racist comments or they think it's okay to uh, disrespect people just because of the color of their skin or their ethnicity. You should be the one that they know it can't be stated in front of you, which will make people uncomfortable and ultimately they will ostracize you. They will make you feel like you shouldn't be invited. You shouldn't be around. And you have to accept the fact that that may be the, the, the case and that if they're not going to have you to be there, and it, this could even be your mother, your father, your sisters, brothers. It could be the big barbecue that you've been going to all your life. Whatever the case may be, you need to, you need to be able to accept um, as an accomplice that you've had to sacrifice in order to continue to show that you're not here just for a short period of time or just for what's convenient, but that you are here and part of this movement for the long term and that you are willing to take whatever, um, uh, pen uh, whatever penalties um, that go along with standing for justice. And that's not easy for, for anybody, not even for those of us who have to do it because of the fact that we are having a lived experience of the racism and the suffering and the oppression every single day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. So I wanna talk a bit about your groundbreaking speech, State of Emergency. In it, um, you mentioned that we learned looting and violence from America, from mm -hmm. history. Can you explain to the audience the importance of naming that? Yeah. You know, first of all, when I said that in my speech, um, you know, it was really raw. It didn't come from a place of me preparing or thinking about what to say. It was just really, really raw. And um, I, I, I said what I know is true. If you think about the entire um, experience, the African experience in America, how we got here, right? We were stolen literally from our country. So some of us would call that looting, right? We were looted from where we were in Africa, in the continent, and brought here to America, to a country or a place that already had folks as the indigenous people and the land was stolen from them. 
Mm-hmm. So this is a this is not some new phenomenon that people when they want something, whether it be out of frustration, out of desperation and need, um, that they would take what they see. We've learned that from this country, literally, we in, in America are constantly across the seas, overseas, in other countries, taking resources um, and meddling in the affairs of other governments and other nations, and sometimes, oftentimes, making the situations in those countries worse um, and, and, and not necessarily providing, um, even with good intention, not necessarily providing the type of healing that needs to be done in these other nations. And so this is something that we as America have been doing for far too long. The forefathers of this nation, if you will, have literally gained their wealth off of taking from the little guys, the little people, um, those folks who work every single day, um, you know, at shifts that me, that you and I are blessed not to have to do in order mm-hmm. for them to be able to stay in positions of power. We think about mass incarceration, yet another system that, that exists where people are, are, are hoarded in and out um, too many times in some not even being able to return to sit and make products and services, answering the phone for the local um, DMV, uh, doing work for little to no money. In a lot of situations, the pay is to be able to get more from commissary or to be able to get more time out in the yard. Uh, This is what America is made of. And so when all of a sudden, there's this big, oh my God, why are people breaking the, the glass of or breaking into targets and auto zones and all of these different businesses? I think we have to ask ourselves as a country, what type of example have we set? And particularly to young people who are frustrated, who do not know what are the other avenues that we need to go to to, to make sure that a George Floyd Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, do not happen. We have not provided enough alternatives to be able to condemn. We have to provide people with something. I was in, I work in the gun violence awareness space. And, um, and, and one of the things we always hear people say, well, you know, no matter what, having a gun and using a gun to kill your brother or sister is just wrong. And I agree with that a thousand percent. But when we start talking about approaching these young people who are on the streets, what we often say is that if we can't put something else in their hands, the gun is what they're going to hold on to. They're not going to allow us to take the gun so that their hand is empty. They need something. So we need to be able to put mental health services, jobs, um, housing, food, and support in their hand so that they don't feel the need to hold the leg which will give them an opportunity to defend and protect themselves and to take what it is that they need because this country does not give them or support them or allow them even the opportunity to gain on their own the things that will help them to be a successful and and a, and a progressive part of our society. So I said it because I know that Uh, the attempt to focus on looting and the burning of buildings would become front and center rather than the idea that George Floyd was murdered in front of the world. And and that too many, too many, including little children, have to deal with the trauma of what they saw over and over again without knowing that there would have been justice at that time because we have failed at providing justice so many in so many of these situations. And even with George Floyd's, um, you know, with the, the verdict for Derek Chauvin, it's good that he's, he's in prison. It's good that he got some time. It's good that he's guilty, um, but it's not enough. It's certain, it's just not enough. Right. That's a long drawn out way of saying whatever, answering you hope. Yes, you did. You did. (laughs) Thank you. So you mentioned young people. And as the mother of a Black son myself, um, I noticed the dedication to your son and your book. 
And um, I noticed also, because my son listened to your book with me, and he heard and received your words about wearing a hoodie that covers his face and head, even though I've warned him of the same thing many times. So given the power of your voice, what would you, what would you say to young Black boys and girls that are growing up in our society today? You know, oftentimes we, when we um, are asked to say something to young people, we want to, especially with me being the mother of a, of, of a young man, we want to go straight to cautioning, caution, caution. And that's, and I'm really good at saying, don't do this, don't do that, don't say this, don't walk this way. Or I know how to, you know, I'm ready for that. But I think instead tonight, I want to take a different direction, which is to say, like, Young people are, are, you all are so powerful. You are like the most valuable player. Like students on the campus there don't necessarily know how powerful they are, that, that the 2022 midterm elections are coming and people are going to be flying from all over the place trying to get your vote, your uh, volunteer time, your few dollars, to support them as they're running for office, you know, people are trying to um, remain in office, um, and you know, certainly the Democratic Party will be all over the world, all over the country, trying its best to explain to people why um, we have to continue to win seats and gain seats so that we can get the type of power that's necessary to pass the laws we care about. That's what that's the, the power that's in the hand the hands of college students, of younger people, know that power, understand it, understand how to manipulate it in your favor. Know that the beauty of uh, just being a young person who has now the opportunity to live life, to find, um, you know, to find paths and, and innovation for so many of the challenges that we face that you're in the best position. Uh, and so I, I, I say, I, you know, I tell young people all the time, man, oh man, if I could go back and do it all over again and be in your space in the spot that you're in right now, especially if you're receiving an education, it's so powerful uh, to be able to, um, you know, to fill your mind and then use that mind as a weapon in this world that is often so cold to, towards so many people. And the only thing that I would, I, would, I would say that it demands of you, though, is that you ensure um, that with every step you take and with every success and with every barrier that you're able to push and break, that you reach back and bring another person with you, that you ensure that the Ray Rays and the Keishas and the people from your community um, who have been, unfortunately, have not had the same opportunities, that you impart upon them the wisdom, the information, maybe open a door, but that you never forget where it is that you come from. There are a lot of people who will tell you, man, you gotta cut the ties. And yes, you do have to make sure that you protect yourself and. And, and when you, as you move on in life, people are not always going to be happy, but you know the ones that need it. And you know the ones in your family and those people in your community that can benefit from the education and the access that you've had and how you provide those experiences for the next person is really all that your journey will be about. I know, you know, I, I unfortunately have attended many funerals. I'm sure you have as well, Erica. And one of the things that is always refreshing to hear when we're listening to the eulogy, when we're listening to family members and friends standing before, um, you know, the, the people who are there, the loved ones, is that she or he or she helps so many other people. Um, you know, you could always count on Sister Erica. You knew that she would be there, you know, to lend a helping hand. And I think that that is the part of your legacy that is going to stand out the most. And sometimes um, for me, maybe it's not just individual people, but also being a part of a movement means that you've dedicated yourself to fighting for um, many people at once, but somehow or another, always find a way to use what God has gifted you with to help gift the rest of the world and ensure that they have access to the opportunities that you have had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
So now we're going to shift to taking some questions from our audience. And um, we have some student questions as well as some other ones. So I'll start with this one, which is intriguing. What kind of role do you find that the police play in activism? I think the police, um, you know, should play even an even bigger role um, in this idea of, you know, activism. I think that police should be at the table in a real way in terms of community policing, um, finding ways to get to know individuals within a community and to know the concerns and the issues happening in a community uh, so that when they are entering the space, they're entering from a place of empathy and sympathy and understanding of all of the different challenges that we face. I think that's how police departments should be developed. Um, and, 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 you know, and it's, it's, they say that the police are trained that way, but it doesn't seem to work in our communities. But I think that the better question or better way of, um, you know, providing insight in this area is to say that policing in terms of how it was established in America is one is something that unless it is torn down as it currently stands and reimagined and rebuilt, it will never play the role that it should play in activism or community. It will never be able to play that role because the, the actual foundation of it was built to harm, to hurt, to enslave, to imprison um, African people and people who were uh, former slaves uh, or formerly enslaved. The entire system of policing was designed to protect the property of white men, to protect the lives of white families. And it was designed as a secondary um, way since, they, since we were supposed to be no, no longer enslaved, it was designed as a secondary way to enslave us. We understand that this is not something that I'm making up or something that some, you know, uh, older legend, um, uh, uh, some, some sort of tale that's been told in our society. We know this from the documentation that is out there that exists from many years ago, from during slavery and even afterwards, we know how policing was established. So if you live in a house and the foundation of that house was not properly done, you're going to continue to see pools of water on the ground, on the floor. You're going to continue to see issues in the bathroom, cracks in the wall, um, you know, different problems, insulation issues. You're going to always have those issues. And just because you fix it up cosmetically on the inside, just because you walk through and put something new down on the floor, it's never going to change because the foundation for the way that the house was built is not, it was not uh, something that was, was built to stand strong. It does not have the type of foundation that's necessary for the house to stand and to be um, a good house, if you will. And therefore it has to be either torn down or deeply, deeply, deeply taken apart and then reconfigured and rebuilt. And we haven't gotten to the point in our country where we're even willing to admit that. We're still saying, you know, we don't want to defund the police. Um, we want to give the police more funding. There needs to be more training. We have yet to recognize that you can train and train and train, but you will never be able to train out the racist roots of how the system of policing was developed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So one of our guests is asking that you define the different types of oppression that exist today that are not openly visible by a lot of people. I mean, I think there are many. It's difficult to sit and just kind of call them off because I could be here, you know, all night, but certainly I will say that there is 100% an oppression that exists towards our LGBTQIA family. Um, we know that uh, our gay brothers and sisters, um, our uh, trans family, um, that there is oppression, very real oppression, oppression 
that um, that they suffer every day and that we it's not always something that we like to talk about for many different reasons. Sometimes because people are just so uneducated about the issues, they don't even know how to discuss it. But that would be one area of oppression that I would certainly, certainly, absolutely speak to. I think also women, um, we as women of all different hues uh, deal with very serious oppression. And it is, um, you know, and, 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 and I think there is this narrative that we, especially as Black women, we are doing well. Um, we're, you know, entrepreneurs. We're uh, what they say, fastest growing entrepreneurs, that we're also, um, you know, highly educated. But we often don't talk about the fact that women, and particularly Black women, are also the fastest growing population of those being incarcerated. Um, and so it's, you know, most, most times, especially with Black folks, we have great things happening on one end, but there are some really, really terrible things happening on the other end. And therefore, it's not, it's not balanced. And, it's, and we're unable to claim victory until we're able to um, look at this other dark side and do, st do different things to enhance um, lives and to, to support those individuals who are suffering with such um, difficulties and oppression and challenges. I would say that our youth in the education system deal with very serious uh, level of oppression, um, that the way in which we educate our young people, the lack of resources, the idea that there's a class system um, to be educated um, is, is something that especially loses our Black boys. We lose our Black boys within that. And those educators um, who are out here really trying to make space for young Black men um, are really heroes because it's so important for us to stop and take the time to figure out how do we create systems that will allow young men to succeed. So I would say education is one of those areas. And of course, ec economically, um, you know, our wealth, the wealth gap, if you will, in this nation between white folks and black folks is shameful. Um, and it is, and I, I do believe that if we had more access to wealth and more organization with the wealth that we actually do possess because we spend $1.4 trillion every single day, but not enough of it. Like a small, I think it's maybe 30% of it circulates in the black community. Our money is always going outside to other communities. And, um, and I think that, you know, even in the ways in which we have access to wealth, access to lending, access to, um, the things that we need in order to build for ourselves, there's certainly a level of oppression that exists um, in those areas. And so I think we could go on and on and on. Um, and I think that oppression, certainly as we look at it, and I understand the question as this one big, big, big umbrella, there certainly are parts of it that people can identify with more based upon how they live their lives and the things that they need in order to, to, to succeed. Right, right. So um, a student asked the question, and they stated that many Black students that are at primarily white institutions feel that they have to take on activism along with their studies. That is extra work that white students don't have. How do you suggest that they find balance? Well, first of all, I found I found I find balance every day. Let me tell you, yes, activism is a party. If you're black and you're in a place, especially around a lot of white folks, you find yourself leaning into activism. Or you could find yourself trying to capitulate and trying to um, you know, to 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 forget your identity and not see the racism and the um, aggression, the microaggressions, you could try not to see that and just try to sort of become one with those individuals who you know um, see you different and treat you different, but hey, it feels okay for you or at least it's easier to just get by. And if that's what you choose, it's nothing that we can do about that. But for those of us who choose to be conscious in those spaces, you're going to come up against different things that you certainly 100% will find yourself having to engage with others who fight to um, make changes, um, to make this make the space more fair and equitable. Um, and so yeah, it is extra work and I don't really have an answer to how not to do it. 
But what I will say is you do need a balance. And I balance because I, uh, you know, I had this thing I, I, I was t- saying to some friends the other day that I was sitting outside of a restaurant one day and this young lady walked by and she said, hey, I know you, you're the twerk and work girl. And I, and I said, oh my God, like people are getting it. Because I had said on the radio the week before that I believe that you can twerk and work. That's the reason why I went to Cardi and said, hey, would you, you know, be a, a part of my book? Because I wanted people to understand. And it's the reason why I'm most proud of that forward, the conversation between Cardi and Angela Davis, Dr. Angela Davis, because I wanted people to understand that you don't have to be one way, walk in the room, speaking only one language, um, looking just buttoned up a certain way to be considered an activist or a leader. We have many different people who come from different walks of life. And I want to make sure that there's space for the young sister who might be on a pole at night to be a part of this work as well, because she actually needs to be the main focus of what it is that we're doing. How can we say that we're here to make space for or create a movement that exists to address the needs of all of us, of, of, the, of the whole, and yet we're willing to leave so many people behind. So I have just decided that being my authentic self that I know I'm going to drop it like it's hot and then still get up in the morning and be at the rally and do all the things that I'm supposed to do. I need a space like that for me. And you need to create that space for you. Not going too far, of course, not getting yourself into trouble that will ultimately discredit you and have you not respected as a leader, but not allowing people to make you feel like you need to hide the truth about the fact that you like to have fun, you like to vacation, you like to go out, you like to party. Those things actually can attract more people to you in the work because they will say, okay, this person is not a leader that I see them doing little things around the corner, but they, but they, they hide it when they come out into the world. I think that's what's worked for me. And it works for other organizers that I tell all the time, you know, be yourself, be true to who you are and ensure that you don't allow people to make you feel like you need to be a liar in order for you to be respected. Right, right. So um, in the same vein, we're gonna, you explain the power that students have on campus. I'd like for you to address what faculty and staff can do to be a part of that same power. And I would think that supporting our students that want to engage in this work is one way, providing space and events like this so they can hear from wonderful people like you. But what else can we do to support our students and the causes that we have on this campus and others? You know, I I appreciate that um, you asking that question because that's not often a question that, um, you know, leaders within the universities um, want to ask um, just because it does put the spotlight on you. But I think that as students organize, as students try to engage in work that would make the campus and the outside community um, you know, a, a more the more of the beloved community, if you will, that you need to have leaders who support them, as you said, people who are willing to stand with them and also to help articulate when in meetings, when in other spaces and other rooms, the needs, the desires, the anguish, the frustration, the, all of those words. Um, to help to help articulate it on different levels and also to be a safe space for young people to come to and say, we don't know, we need help. We need somebody who's willing to sacrifice for themselves. We need accomplices who are in the leadership within a particular institution who are willing to take those sacrifices by being the one to speak up on behalf of the student. And then also students have to be willing to listen and understand that this is not a, um, what is it, uh, all or take, uh, what is it, take all or none? It's not that type Mm -hmm. of environment. You have to be willing to play an inside outside game. You've got to know when to go in and when to focus on your work and what you're supposed to be doing. So when it's the middle of, you know, midterm exams, 
um, and you're supposed to be studying, it's probably not the biggest, the, the best time to be organizing major rallies and activities, unless of course there is some emergency happening in society and you have to do what you have to do, but you should be able to show or give your um, leadership the opportunity to go and say, hey, during midterms, you know, we kept everybody focused. They really were kind of not so much quiet, but they focused a lot of their attention on their on their studies. But now, you know, they're serious about points one, two, five, and ten on this agenda list. We've helped them to create the list, and now we've got to figure out ways to address it. I think that more than anything is the best way to be as an as a to be an advocate and a support system, and again, an accomplice to students who are out here trying to do the right thing, because ultimately, if the system works better for students, it's going to work better for black and brown um, leaders within the institution as well. If it works for students on a campus, it's gonna work better in society. And it certainly will become a model for what other institutions around the nation can adopt in order to make their space um, more fair and friendly and, and, and to make their space um, more of a place that people who are black and brown feel comfortable. Right, right. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. Um, what would you say to the people who want to get into advocating uh, for activism, who don't have as many opportunities or resources to rely on or connections, finances, knowledge, or even experience? If you have a cell phone in your hand, you got everything you need. And saying that you don't know how is an excuse because this phone has so much power. You can find people who are like-minded. Like you can start a campaign online, which will draw people to you. You can get involved with advocacy work um, without leaving your home if necessary until you can find the type of environments that you can get out there in the world. So as long as you have a cell phone, and there ain't many of us that don't have a cell phone, uh, an iPad, a computer, and some Wi-Fi, you now have, you are now deputized. I have deputized you as an organizer, as a leader, as an activist. All you got to do is get in there, follow people, and follow news outlets and, and other activists, figure out what they're doing, you know, look for BLM chapters in your city um, that you can follow and, and learn about the issues that are happening, follow the news feeds, read the news, be informed, and it will give you um, the information that you need to figure out how to go to step two. So there are many ways, but this, this device is probably one of the most powerful um, and, oh, and it, it's a gift and curse. And a lot of times for me at this point, at this stage in my life, it's a curse, um, but it is a gift also um, that you can use to get your activism started. There's no excuses. There is a way. It, we find everything we're looking for. The newest Jordans are coming out. We know where to go. We know how to get online early to, to sign up, to get the bag, to get the thing, to... Whatever we want to do, we know how to do it. But when it comes to becoming an activist or getting involved in the issue, we often feel stagnant and we don't have to take that approach. We can actually use the resources that's in our hand and, and, and allow that to be the guiding post, if you will, for how we get involved in making this world a better place for all of us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Tamika, for your willingness to sit down with me and to Thank have this you, virtual Sarah. conversation. I'm grateful for your presence in this world. And thank you for your sacrifice to pursue justice. And thank I just you like so to much. say to you, until freedom. Until freedom. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you, Miss Erica. I appreciate you. And to all those from Oregon State who were involved in helping to pull tonight together, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us as well. While preparing for this event, I considered what it's been like for me living in Central Oregon. I know that I have earned privilege, but the truth is I can go two weeks or longer without seeing another person that looks like me in this community. 
like so many others who are underrepresented in their communities, I too have been called names, been accused of not supporting my own people, and have had to ignore negative social media posts. I also endure microaggressions and some macroaggressions almost every day. However, that is nothing compared to what so many others have endured doing this work. And I want to celebrate my friends, my colleagues, those that I just know by name, as well as those around Oregon and around the United States for continuing to do this thankless work. Together, we are making a difference. I'll never stop working for everyone, everywhere, to simply love your neighbor, regardless of the skin that they are in. I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Nikki Burton, Dorian Smith, Connect Central Oregon, and the OSU Cascades Marketing and Communications team for making this event a huge success. Thank you again for joining us. Good night to each of you.